So we all know that gardening has increased dramatically in popularity and we've yes, got lots and lots of new viewers and new subscribers to our YouTube channel. And so I wanted to start off the show a little different this week and kind of just give, not necessarily give a little background, just explain what this is. This is our weekly gardening show. It's actually the longest running father and son gardening show on the internet. Um, <laughs> we call it the Row by Row Garden Show. It airs every Thursday night. Um, you can watch it on our Facebook page or you can watch it on YouTube. Um, so what we do is we talk about what's going on in our gardens. We usually have a little main segment there in the middle somewhere and then we answer some viewer questions from the previous week's show at the end of the show. So that's what we do here. If you're new to the channel, if you're new to the show, kind of give you a little background uh, on what we do here. And um, if you are new, if this is your first episode you've ever watched, you know, hit that subscribe button, hit that bell button. And if you've been watching the show for a long time, we always appreciate having you here. Well, what's happening is a lot of new people out there want to start gardening. Mm -hmm. I've had people email us, I mean, asking questions, and that's great. It really is. But what we're seeing is a lot of these people that are starting the garden take this thing for granted. I'm going to give you an example of this. Mm -hmm. So we live in a rural area here, and I got a neighbor down the road down there, and, and I thought the boy had good sense. I really did. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to start him a garden. So he goes down, comes down here and borrows my tiller and goes down there and starts the stuff up. So I'm so busy, I can't help him a whole lot, but we talk about it a little bit and he gets everything rigged up and gets his drip tape in and he calls me once when he come down there. And this boy picks out the wettest spot on his whole property underneath the oak tree mm. to put in the vegetable garden. Mm. Now, I, the boy I thought, I thought he was raised on the farm and I thought the boy I said now he's got plenty more sense than this but that's what he did and we got two and a half inches of rain he planted yeah, his cool. garden he got two and a half inches of rain guess what's happened now he don't have a garden no more it washed away it washed away so this is and I talked to uh, Michael a long time customer of ours down in High Springs Florida this morning Michael's been gardening like me all his life and we talked about this here Gardening is not a skill set that you pick up overnight. You cannot expect to go out there and to throw your garden out there knowing nothing about gardening and be successful. Now, what we are here for is to help you through that journey or through that process to be successful at gardening because a lot of people are not, they get frustrated, and we're trying to break that tradition and help you go through the process and be successful. But here's the deal. You got to do a little research on your own. You got to use that noggin up there and do a little thinking and planning out and do it the correct way. And we will help you walk through that journey. It's so, one of those things. You're going to be better your second year than you were your first year and probably better your third year than you were your second year. Yes. A and when you get to where you're doing it as long as we have, you still going to have years that ain't worth a toot. Uh, it's just one of those things. But you will get better. A and gardening to me, the, the people that really struggle with gardening, gardening, you got to kind of have a feel. You got to sometimes, you know, at least once they walk out to your garden and just kind of be perceptive, see what's going on, and just kind of have a feel for what you need to do. And sometimes it takes a little while to acquire that feeling. Uh, but once it becomes more innate to you, I think it, it, it becomes a lot more natural. Well, I've told this people this in the past, and I, I don't, I, I mean this just like it sounds, so don't take this the wrong way. I believe that God has given everybody a talent in life. Yeah. Mine, I love music, but I can't play music, but I love music. I wish I had that talent, but I don't. If you ever heard me sing, you'd say, Greg, you just didn't get it, son. What I did get is I can walk out into the garden, I can walk by a plant, and I can get a sense of what it needs. Yeah. It just comes to me naturally to do things. Now, I know it doesn't to other folks, and that's the reason I feel it's compelled upon us to help those other people that don't have that talent. But I have that gift. I can actually sense what I need to do, and it's just second nature to me to do that. So, like I said, we, we want to help other people in that journey. Gardening skill set is very important right now. We've been preaching for a long time for people to start learning this because it's not something that's just boom, you do. It's something that you learn and you get better at. So even if you're a beginner, take it easy, understand the process, and we will get through it and you will learn it and you will be a better person in the end when you understand how all this is done and you can go out there and enjoy gardening because you're successful at it. Don't get frustrated, but understand it is a process. I agree with you on uh, everybody's got one thing to get at. I've always told my wife that. I, I think everybody's got one thing 
Now, they may never find that one thing because it could be ping pong or something off the wall. Right. Everybody's got one thing that they are just top of the line at. And, and the quicker you can find that one thing you're real good sure. at, sure, the better off you I can was be. lucky I found mine early in life. Right. Some people spend a whole life searching. For they that. do. And I struggled with it for a long time, asking myself that question of what I am good at. Because I found out a lot of things I wasn't good at. Yeah. I mean, a lot of them. That happens. That happens. Well, uh, another thing, if you're new to the show, we always like to eat a little something on the show. Some people, it kind of bothers a little bit, but uh, it don't bother us one bit. So I've got a little snack here because I know you've been working hard back there. And uh, these are some mulberries. And uh, if you've never eaten fresh mulberries or been around a mulberry tree, they are quite the treat. Now, my mulberries... Didn't produce as well this year for a couple reasons. And they, they seem to get cycles. I have two real good years and then kind of an off year. I trimmed them back pretty hard this year, the tree, because them limbs would get on my roof and scratch on the roof and make a lot of racket. So I trimmed them back pretty good. And also, when we get a real, if we get a real hot spell in February and then it turns around, we get that last frost. Well, it throws in fruit trees for a loop. and, and so, Mulberries are notorious for getting them blooms bit off by some and, cold uh, weather. Now, if you ain't never seen a mulberry, they look real similar to what a blackberry is. Well, they got stem in them. I'll tell you a little story. Travis come in to work one day years ago, and he said, man, I got a blackberry tree I ain't never seen before in my life. And I had to explain to him what a mulberry tree was. If you ain't never seen a mulberry tree, it will throw you for a loop because you think you got a blackberry tree. You yeah, remember, they taste remember a little, that? Yeah, I remember, remember that. Yeah. They taste a little different. They're a little more tart. And they got a stem that runs through them unlike a blackberry does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Birds Most, love them. Boy, if you want to draw your birds into your yard, plant you a mulberry Now, they will stain your fingers. I got from picking these this morning. And uh, my old boys like to walk around barefoot. And the ones that fall on the ground, they'll be walking out there picking them, eating them. And they'll have red all over the feet, face, Make and real good wine. Make real good jelly. We made some mulberry sorbet, or kind of like ice cream mm -hmm. out of it before. And real good. Yeah, it is. And we usually have plenty enough. We put them, it's usually a key component of our vegetable bag operation this time of year. But like I said, kind of an off crop this year. So we just been, you know, going out there snacking, picking a few as we Are you talking go. about foraging off the land? That is perfect. That's a perfect fruit rare to forage off the land there. Have you a couple of them? Yeah. So we got something to eat there. I do want to apologize something last week. Now, uh, I said I made a little joke there about Alabama folks and their math skills, and I had a few people upset about get that. Up, real upset about it. Oh, and so I, I, I wanted to clarify myself a little bit. So we we do occasionally. I do slip up and make an Alabama joke every now and then. Now I got a lot of good friends in Alabama. I've got friends that went to the University of Alabama and then University of Auburn. My w wife and myself went to the University of Georgia. So there's a bit of a little college football rivalry there. No, there's a lot of it there. Yeah, Alabama has kicked our tail for years. College football in the South is a huge thing. And Alabama has been a rival of Georgia for ages and ages. And I'm going to tell you, they have they have got a football program that we've always been envious of, and they have kicked our tail. Ain't got much of a math program. But well, they've kicked our tail several <laughs> times, and Alabama's our neighbor. So you know how you are about your neighbor. You love your neighbor, and you can talk about your neighbor, but you don't want nobody else talking about your neighbor. That's the way we feel about Alabama. We love them. We love to pick on them because they kick our tail in football, and we feel like the only way we can get a jab back in every now and then is talking about their education. <laughs> now, it's all in fun, folks. Don't get upset about this right here. We love folks in Alabama, but it Anytime we feel like we can get them back just a little bit, we feel like the opportunity needs to arise. We kind of hit it. And believe it or not, uh, per capita, Alabama is our biggest state yep. as far as customers. Now, Texas is our biggest state. That's just because Texas is huge. But if you looked at, if you took the number of customers and number of orders and divided by the, the population in the state, Alabama is our biggest they state. Are, and I've talked to a lot of people who visited Alabama. There are more people go, have backyard gardens in Alabama than anywhere I have ever seen. Lots of good, good, knowledgeable gardeners in Alabama. So yep. we love Alabama. We didn't mean anything by it. We just like, to, we got a lot of friends over there. Uh, like the throw that jab every night. That's right. Uh, uh, about the quarantine, I want to talk about the quarantine a little bit. A lot of people um, seem to be, you know, struggling with it. You can tell if you've, you've uh, kind of thumbed through Facebook a little bit. Some people having a hard time with the quarantine. You could tell it's kind of wearing on them a little bit. But for me personally, I don't feel like it's 
I pro I maybe go to town and get takeout less than I you know which I would normally do once or twice a week. I don't really do that uh, anymore. But I don't, it hasn't really affected my life a whole lot. Well, it's easy for people to fall into a state of depression when their life is unsettled. I talked to a guy the other day in Alabama, and he said, I'm getting everything done around my house that I haven't got done in the last 20 years. So take this opportunity if you are quarantined. I understand how you can sit in that recliner and get depressed thinking about everything that's going on. Get out there and get busy. There's no better remedy for depression than a tired back. So if you got out there and work in that yard and that garden all day long, I guarantee you're going to sleep better that night. So get out there and do something. Have an activity. Use this time to do some of those things that you thought you wanted to do for a long time. And do not sit in that house and get depressed because that's where, that's where uh, uh, something says something about an idle mind. That's where you get in trouble at. If you, get, right. if you get out there and get to work and you get your mind to get clear. Yeah. I've said a lot of times that backer packs will cure a lot of people thinking a lot deeper than what they should. Yeah, don't don't be sitting inside watching that watching the news channel all day. It'll get you all messed up. Get out there and work. Um, so we had a pretty good storm come through uh, this <clears throat> past weekend, and we're subject to have one. I think I saw the news. Subject to have another one this mm -hmm. Sunday. But um, and I did a video, and boy, my squash patch looked pretty dang pitiful after that storm. Mm -hmm. But but as of this morning. It had, I did lose a couple plants, but as of this morning, the plants I still got there have turned the corner big time. I got flowers, I got little squash. I do too. Um, so the plants are looking a lot better. I'm gonna hit them with some fertilizer uh, in a day or two, give them another bump there. Um, but one thing I wanna talk about, after a hard rain like that, I got three inches here, I don't know how much I you got. I got two and a half. After a hard rain like that. Now, we all know, you know, Injecting some fertilizer will give plants a good pop, but after a hard rain, as soon, as soon as you can get in there and cultivate, you know, I got one spot where my tomatoes are planted, it can take three inches of rain one morning, I can still get out there that afternoon, it drains that well. I got other plots in my dream garden, I have to wait a couple of days, but as soon as you can get in there and cultivate, Get in there, and if you cultivate beside those plants and re-aerate that soil, boy, you will see them pop. The bit, one of the best implements to do that with is to cultivate tea. That's right. Take you a couple or three of them, spread them out, put them on there, and run through them. Best of them. An old timer told me one time, he said that that soil's got to breathe, and that's what you're doing when you bust it up. You're letting it breathe. If you don't let it breathe, you're causing some issues there. Go through there and bust it up, let it breathe. You would be surprised what good it does for your soil, for your ecosystem there with your, your beneficials, and for your plants. Yeah, so not only do you keep that crust from forming, which is going to make your soil hard to work, but, man, given that aeration beside those plants, it does wonders, and you can, you can see them pop. It's almost like you went in there and added fertilizer to it. Yeah, believe it or not, root <clears throat> systems take a certain amount of oxygen. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so we I had a video. We was talking about the kind of the effects of the storm, how things were going. I also talked about in that video that Avalon corn, which you planted some of. And I mentioned this in my video, but I kind of want to get your take on it. That that is some of the best germinating and fastest to come up, fastest growing corn I have ever seen. If y'all, <sighs> if any y'all bought in that, have any trouble getting it up or or getting it going. You ain't holding your mouth right or something. Now, what's the reason behind that? That's something I do not understand. So I planted Hickory King, and then I planted Avalon, and the germination time frame there was completely different. It took my old heirloom a long time to come up, and that Avalon popped. I don't know, and I was a little worried about buying because I, I caught a cold spell after I planted it, but it didn't affect it one bit. Uh, I have never I don't seen really, corn pop like that. I don't really understand it either. I don't know why, but I just want to tell you that Avalon, that's some, that stuff will come up. And it, yep. I, if it tastes as any as good as it grows, we're going to have some fine, fine sweet corn. Yeah, and, and I don't want to dwell on this, but y'all know we, we're running pretty high volume on the orders and everything. And we're having a lot of people call in, email, want to change or add to orders and all this. And in the past, we've been able to do things. We've been able to offer exceptional customer service. But folks, I'm going to tell you, we cannot at this time add, change, or manipulate orders any. And the reason being is we're running it over full capacity on our system, but not only our system, but our employees and our shipping. we got trucks showing up here three to four times a day picking up. 
So if you wait an hour or if I'm out there working and I don't get your email for an hour, that packet very well could be shipped and going to the post office or UPS hub or wherever. We just don't have time to make changes. Another thing, I can't dig through a, tr uh, a truck for 30 minutes to find a package to add a pack of Bella Rosa seeds to. As much as I love to help everybody out, we're just not capable of doing this at this time. Maybe later on, things will change and we can get back to offering you the type of customer service we think you deserve. But at this moment, we just cannot do it. Yeah, I want to talk about that for a minute. I don't really, I don't know if it's from people that, that don't order online a lot. I don't know where people got this idea that you can place an order online and then call and change that order because you can't do that with Amazon. I'm not aware of any online vendor where you can do that. Um, I've never we, tried we, to do and it. I'm not saying we've spoiled our, we we have went above and beyond because we think it's important on our customer service in the past. Maybe that was a mistake on our part. <laughs> I don't know, our, but I, I can tell you at this point it's biting us in the rear end a little bit. Yeah, so if you if you forgot something on your order, just place another order. Yeah. That's all you got to do. It's all with systems with us. We, ha we have this system in place to get everything it's out. automated. We don't see every order. I mean, when it comes in, we don't pack every order. There's lots of orders come through we never know of. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the people in the back, they're working fast. They, they're trying to get things out. And it's just not, it's just not possible. The other thing is we can't change a shipping address once it's been packed. Because like he said, it could take us 30 minutes to an hour digging through boxes and pallets trucks. and trucks to find a package. We don't know where that package is once it's labeled. Uh, it's somewhere in our warehouse, but we don't know specifically where. So when you're placing your order online, make sure you double check your address and get it right. Because once it's packed, it's going to wherever you told us to send it. Uh, so just just double check that there. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is these puppies right here. So we all know what happened to my taters, you know, learn my lesson on that. Speaking of that, I'm glad I held off and ain't put my okra in the ground yet because this little last cool spell we had, them mm. okra transplants, somebody else may have made yeah, a little I bit I planted of me a little spot the other day. I, I'm, we'll wait and see. Anyway, you need, uh, rule of thumb is you need to wait three to four weeks after you plant your tomatoes before you plant your okra. So I'm going to get my okra transplants in this weekend. This is my plan B for where most of my taters rotted. And uh, I was going to go with that horse butternut variety we got. But then I, I got this one in. Got, there's a, a buddy of ours, and I think he's in Virginia, named Edmund. And he's got a breeding program with a lot of winter squash and stuff. And uh, these seeds should be on the website as of the time this video airs. The guy's got a website, somewhat, it's called Commonwealth Seeds. Commonwealth Seed Growers. Yeah, he's a seed like. breeder. He's got some interesting stuff if you ever want to look it up. Anyway, so this is a variety called South Anna Butternut Squash. And what they did is they took a Waltham Butternut, which is probably the most popular butternut out there, and a Seminole Pumpkin. And they crossed them, and they crossed them enough, generation after generation, to where they have a stabilized, open-pollinated new variety here. So it was once a hybrid. Now it's it's a stabilized, open-pollinated variety. And I got pretty dang good germination on it. And this. the reason for this was, we all know the Seminole pumpkin has attributes to it that a lot of the other squash do not have, such as disease uh, resistance, insect resistance, and just plain old vigor and heat tolerance. Does ex extremely well in the South. It's also patterned down in mildew resistance. So his thought in doing this was trying to get those traits into the butternut. So you got the shape of the butternut plus the vigor and disease resistance of the, and those probably could have went in uh, yeah. earlier this week but i'm gonna try to get them in tomorrow this weekend and uh, we're gonna get those in the ground on some drip tape really excited about growing that south anna butternut and we'll have those on the site for you to check those out but uh you know seminole pumpkins a great variety mixing that with a butternut can't go wrong there all right all right all let's right. talk about before we get into the meat and potatoes let's talk about onions just oh minute. yeah yeah i forgot i brought some onions so my onions and i showed this in my video the other day it's starting to i can grab them all here i ha, i kind of have not been paying a whole lot of attention to them and I, I like i said on that video i let my weeds get the best of me with my onions this year but i just went out there the other day and 
He dog if I ain't got some tops falling over on them. So well, and I was going to talk to people about that. I had the same thing. That little storm come through. When you see your tops start dying back, like this is right here, or specifically falling over. So this one here ain't it's that time, dead, but it's fell over. It is time to get them out of the ground. I, I had the same issue. I walked down and I said, "Whoop! It's time to get onions out." So when you see that, you need to get them. Here can be your issue, and this is where we have an issue right now. In the past, I had pulled them and not realized it had a rain coming there. I like to pull them, let them stay right there. Just turn them upside down, mm -hmm. let them cure out there for a couple of days, let that sun dry them out a little bit. Seems to do great for the uh, storing process. We've been hit with a little cool spell here in the last few days, and we're calling for 80% rain in about three days. Mm -hmm. So kind of in a conundrum right now about what to do. I like to turn mine up and let them get a couple of days of sunshine. I don't know if I'm going to have that opportunity to do that to this rain's over with. They do not cure well. They do not store well if they if they don't dry a little bit out there in the field. Yeah, so I, I you just flip yours over in the garden. I like to lay mine out there on the grass and let it them dry for a few days the same way. But, but considering that rain coming, we're probably going to have to... Um, I'm probably just going to have to go straight to my storage rack with them. And I may if, have to, too. If you're interested in that storage rack, I do got a video out there showing how I built that thing. Now, this is an onion I went out and pulled out this morning. Unbeknownst to me, I, I seen Travis walk in with those small onions, and I, I, I went out and pulled this one out here. Now, I normally try to grow the jumbo onions. As you can see here, Travis grows kind of the medium-sized onions here. But this is the one I pulled up yesterday afternoon and was letting it dry a little bit because the top had fell over. You see that right there? When you see that, got to get them up. If you don't, you're going to start getting moisture down in that crown right there and they're going to start rotting. That's about as big as them folks from Florida brought last year. That's normally the size of onion I'm attempting to grow there. I'm not into the little medium-sized onions. I try to grow a big onion when I grow an onion. Now, they might believe you, but I, I will. you don't normally grow onions that big. Well, it comes straight out of my garden. I know, but normally your onions look just like this, which is a normal. Well, it's hard onion. for me to believe you picked out some of your biggest onions to bring this morning. I didn't. Oh, okay. All I, I just I went, okay. I went along the road. So what you're saying is you ain't got no proof that you grew a bigger onion than that. Yeah, I do got bigger onions. But you don't have them. They, 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 they would not fall over. You don't have them here today to no, show. No, no, they wasn't falling over. Okay. Ain't that ain't. There ain't nothing wrong with that onion right there. No, there's there. not, but it's just a medium that's size. That's a gaudy of, onion. Eh? That's just a, that's the what I grew. It's jumbo onions. Nobody enough wants that, move an on. onion that big. Um, so these are, this is the sweet harvest variety. We grew, we got two Vidalia types, or uh, Granix types yes. on our site. We got yes. the Savannah Sweet and the Sweet Harvest. I grew some of the Savannah Sweets as an early crop that I harvested green onions, and this Sweet Harvest did real good. Um, like I said, I, I let my weeds go a little bit on my onions, which compromised my size a little bit. But I think most people would be pretty happy with uh, yeah. that's yeah. a good, good store-bought onion right yeah. there. Yeah. Okay, we done made a mess, as always. All right, so the main topic we want to talk about this week, and I, I can't remember if it was on YouTube or just Facebook. Just here told me. I'll yeah, take care of it. you just pile it up. Um, somebody said, we're talking about, you know, being new to gardening, and if, if you just had a limited space, what would you plant? And so the question was posed, if you just had, you know, in your backyard, all you had room for was a 20 by 20 in-ground garden, what would you plant there? And so there's a lot of things to consider with that, you know, what time of year it is, all this stuff. So I thought I'd just draw up my own little diagram and tell you what I would plant right now, not what I would have planted had I started in January or February. So what I would plant if I was going to start right now, till me up a spot and put me in a 20 by 20 garden. And I've even got some varietal suggestions. Now keep in mind, this could be different for everybody because some people don't like cucumbers, <coughs> other people do. Right, this could be different for everybody. So, so don't be planting nothing that you don't want to eat. And then I, the way I designed this was, was to, to stack this stuff in there thick. Sure. And some vertical garden. Some vertical garden. So we got our 20 by 20 square plot here. And then I've got that sectioned off into kind of four foot wide quadrants here. Because I think that's general average row space and you can stack stuff in there pretty tight. Four foot or so apart. Um, so the first row here, we got pole beans. We're going to grow some things vertically because we're limited on space. And if, if it was just me and I was just growing one row of pole beans, I would plant me some of these Kentucky blue pole beans there. Rattlesnake would be another good one. 
but I would go with that Kentucky blue. So I would do that, and I would plant them. I'd put my trellis on the inside of the plot. I'd plant them on the outside so they could grow out a little bit this way if they had to save a little space that way. And pole beans are one of those things that don't have a lot of pest pressure in the springtime. You can get by with growing them. may not even have to spray them for anything. So it's a good... They don't take a lot of fertilizer. You can over fertilize them. So back off that a little bit. And don't fertilize them like you would your cucumbers, I mean, excuse me, your tomatoes or your peppers. It's an easy crop to grow with a lot of return to it. Right. So put you can put your little hoarding over trellis up right there, a few T posts. You wouldn't need but two or three T posts. So your row would be 20 foot wrong. Yeah. Now I'm going to tell you folks, you can pick a lot of pole beans off a 20 foot row. That's right. That's yeah. Right. I mean, you can have plenty to feed your family and to can. That's right. On my second row here is where I would put some nightshades. And I've got tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant. And you can vary this depending on how much each you want. But on a 20 foot row, you're gonna get about 10 plants in there, two feet apart. So if it was me, I would plant five tomato plants, I would plant three pepper plants, and I would plant two eggplants. Mm -hmm. So the tomato I would go with, and this is based off how my tomato plants are doing currently and some evidence last year. I, I think I would have to go with this brickyard. Of all the ones I planted, now my red snappers and my summer picks are looking dang good, but I'd be dog with those brickyard plants I got. I'm working. becoming a big, I, I looked at mine yesterday, and I, I, everybody knows I love Bella Roses, but I do believe, I do believe that brickyard variety has more vigor than the Bella Roses does. Now, yeah. I'm not going to say it's a better tomato. I believe it's, got, I believe it's as good a tomato, but I believe that plant's got more vigor. Yeah, I, I can't deny it. Uh, it, my my brickyard's looking pretty pretty stellar. I'm gonna have to see about the red snapper and the summer pit because those are looking pretty dang good too. But uh, if I was just gonna grow one, plant five plants for canning, whatever, I'd plant that brickyard. As far as peppers go, you know, whatever you like. I would probably do one banana, one bell pepper, and then maybe another, like a cubanelle or something. But whatever you like there. And then on the eggplant, we got several different sizes and colors of eggplant. And a lot of people like to grow the traditional round or egg-shaped eggplant, but the most productive, the most biomass of harvest you're gonna get is from this purple shine, these elongated eggplants. I, I've been growing that purple shine for the last three or four years. I hadn't grown the traditional eggplant in a long time. Ever since I started growing them, I've, I've stayed with These that. will outmake they will. the other ones uh, by two to one at least. So. If you just had two to plant there, that's the ones I would go with. On a third row there, I would put okra. And uh, if I just was going to grow one variety of okra, everybody knows I'd grow that jambalaya there. Yeah, and this could very well, if you live way up north and you have a short growing season, you may not want to plant okra. You may want to do something else. But if you live in the south, that okra is a fine plant to have. And it lasts for a long time. And there's several ways of cooking it. And it's a good staple to have in your, in your meal plan. Now, we'll say this about the jambalaya because we've been asked this uh, every now and then on some of our ads. If, if you can't get out there and pick your okra every other day, you might not want to grow this jambalaya. It's best picked at around three to four inches long. If you can only pick your okra every three or four or five days, Go with something like that Perkins Long Pot, Red Burgundy. Cow horn. Cow horn. Uh, those stay tender at a little longer length. If you want to grow okra, if your goal is grow okra, that jambalaya is it. We're testing a new variety this year. I don't want to give too much out there. We're, we're testing a new variety that claims to have uh, similar productivity as that one. But we'll, Can't let the cat we'll, out of the we'll yeah. keep that to ourselves. My fourth row, I would put some squash and, and uh, zucchini on that. If I had to pick just two, I mean, lots of good choices there, but I, you can't go wrong with that gold prize, good straight neck. Uh, you get a little more squash off a straight neck than you do a crook neck, so straight neck. And then a, a good zucchini, we got several, but uh, I would probably go with this Pascola right here because it's got some really good disease resistance. And then the last row, uh, couldn't go wrong with the diamede, but I picked the stonewall cucumber and uh, I would do, if I just had a 20 by 20 garden, I think I would do all slicers instead of picklers because you just get a little more cucumber. You, you do, unless you're into pickling. We're into pickling huge here and I plant way more. I got one row of slicers planted, but I always plant way more pickles than we do slicers because yeah. we love to pickle. So you could vary that however you want to do it. So that's what I would do if I had... I could grow, I could grow a heap of food in a 20 yep. by 20 garden if I planned it like this. I mean, it, 
it, it don't seem like a big space, but you could get a bunch of food in there. You can, and you can take those cucumbers that you got on the end, and you can grow them a vertical way too. Put you that hortanova net and, and grow them up on that. I actually have a row planted like that right now. So you know, you can take some of these things, put that net in there, and grow it up straight, and save yourself on a little room and. and be more intensive about your garden and get more off a small piece of plot with uh, those those techniques like that. Pack it in there tight. Pack so it in there. I'd be interested to hear from you folks out there if you know what would you do if you just had a 20 by 20 or maybe that is all you have maybe you have a smaller space but a lot of our customers have bigger gardens so if you just had a 20 by 20 if you just could do five rows what would you plant in there? I'd really be interested to see how, you know, everybody's got some different tastes. Everybody likes different sure. things. But, uh, and there's no use to spend no time, money, or effort on something you don't like. So if you don't like pickling cucumbers or slicers, plant you something that you do like. But it goes to show you, 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 you don't know, need... So we didn't touch on there, and the reason we didn't, because it's not a necessity, but if some people may want flower, plant a row of flowers in plant there. Plant a row of flowers. I didn't add sweet potatoes just because they can take up a lot of room. They can. Uh, and flowers do not give to the to the food. You can't well, eat flowers. Well, it's hard to. You can't, but it's hard to. <laughs> so flowers is kind of a luxury. That's right. Um, so, yeah, let us know what you think about that. Uh, I thought that was a really interesting question uh, to pose there. I almost wish I had time to do a video series and, and get in somebody's backyard and just grow that garden. Well, right it there. would be, and I've been wanting to do this for a long time, and I ain't been able to do it, but it's been on my mind. But lay some templates out there for people. So a 20 by 20, a 40 by 40, but have two or three different templates for like how- Like a victory garden template or something. Yeah, but have for different type of people, <coughs> excuse me. So somebody that's got a big family that's got a 40 by 4 garden, lay a template out there of what you grow, when, why, and how, and all that. Do the same thing with a smaller garden, like a 20 by 20. I think that would hold be- Hold the hand. Hold the hand, show them what they need, and give them resources to get what they need. Yeah, yeah. I, I need when I retire, that may be what I, I need. Do. A, I need a bigger marketing department if I'm going to yeah. do that. Let's get in some questions. Okay, so we got a few questions from last week's show, and uh, as always, if you have any questions, put those in the comments. If we answer your question on the show, send us an email to cussserve at hostools.com, and we'll be glad to send you a nice little prize. First one comes from the blank man. What's your recommendation on how to deal with crabgrass? It's really thick. I've been doing no-till methods for four years now, and it's the only thing that comes back. Crabgrass is tough. I'm battling a little crabgrass in my second planting of carrots right now, and it, it has almost got to the point where I, I might scratch it. Um, in some of my plots, it's not too bad. Some of it's real bad. Crabgrass is one of those things that can really, it's tough even with the wheel hoe to remove because they have such a huge root structure. You pull up one of the big crabgrass things, it could have a, a gallon of dirt there attached to it. So crabgrass is tough. The trick is you got to remove it when it's small. If you ever let it go to seed, man, it will reseed and reseed and reseed. It will reseed throughout the spring when it gets to a certain temperature and all through the summertime. And, and, and just to touch on this a bit, you know, I, if you people watch our channel, they know we don't do the no-till thing. And uh, one of the reasons I don't do no-till is because even if you do no-till, you still can't eliminate all your weeds because weed seed blows in from the wind, from bird poop. You've got all these environmental sources from weed seeds, and uh, you either have to go out there and remove it by hand if you got no-till. If, you, if you've got some, uh, like we do, we can take tools or whatever to go out there and remove it. Crabgrass is tough. you got to get it when it's small and, um, you know, Pull up the whole thing. So if you're not in the no-till and you're having some crabgrass issues, this is one thing you can do. Plant some of these thick cover crops such as sordan, sor, <laughs> sorghum, sedan grass, or, or sun hemp. And, and here's the reason why. That crabgrass seed needs germ, uh, sunlight to germinate. So if you block, you get a cover over that soil there with some of these cover crops, you break that cycle by that seed not being able to get that sunlight to germinate and it goes bad. So it, you know, put some of these summer crop, these summer cover crops in place there and not letting that soil lay dormant out there will help dramatically with some of these weeds that are troublesome, such as careless weed and such as crabgrass. Yeah. Break that cycle. You're, you're, you're doing your soil a lot of good by incorporating these organic matters, but mainly weed pressure. By, and you want one that's really 
thick that's going to cover it and not let any sunlight do. And I can't think of two better ones than sun hip and sorghum sedan grass. That's right. <clears throat> Number two is from Ronnie Pate. He says, if there was only one cherry, one salsa, and one sandwich, so you got to pick three here. Mm -mm. One cherry, one salsa, and one sandwich tomato that you could plant, what would they be? He's looking for a dependable producer here. I don't know if the yellow pear falls into the cherry tomato family. Yeah, I would say so. You say so? Yeah. I've been planting the yellow pear for about four years now. I'm trying a new one this year. The sweetie. The sweetie, but I can testify to that yellow pear. That's what the fellow here wants us to testify. Testimony. Testify. Testify. So anyhow, I would grow the yellow pear. It's an indeterminate, so it's going to get big on you. You're going to have to give it some uh, panels or something for it to grow and some support. But it's going to yield like crazy. They're yellow. They're great to eat. Good snack and good in salads. Well, there goes my cherry tomato, mm -hmm. yellow pear. The salsa tomato, I've been growing that one, that OP variety. What's the name of it? Amish paste. Amish paste. I've been growing it for the last probably four years. You know, for an open pollinate variety, it's pretty doggone good. Now, we've got a hybrid in this year that we're testing. Atachi. Atachi. I can't testify to it, but I can testify to that Amish paste. That's a good one. It has, for, for OP variety, it has pretty doggone good disease resistance. That's right. For my sandwich tomato, whoo, I'd have to go with my standby Bella Rosa. Uh, Brickyard be strong number two there, but I'd have to go with my Bella Rosa. All right. Those are all good three suggestions. All good three. Uh, I, I might would switch out for the cherry and go with the sun gold, um, but but I, I can't disagree with the other two. Yep. All right. So Casey Coleman says, any tips for keeping Bermuda grass out of garden? I till three times over a three-week span this year and rake as many of the rhizomes and roots out as best as possible, and a couple of days later, Bermuda popping up. I had to deal with this when I was helping out, uh, when I was doing that consulting uh, south of here a little bit. They, they, we were starting new gardens in basically a Bermuda grass pasture. And uh, it's tough because Bermuda grass has got them rhizomes in there. You can even go out there and spray it with Roundup and it'll come back because a lot of the plant structure is underground with those rhizomes. The one thing that we tried a lot, we didn't use Roundup because we were practicing organic there um, but the one thing we did find that works is this tarp and till technique so what you do put wait till your spring if you got Bermuda grass right now you might as well just fight it get your spring crops in once summer heat comes in and you can't really grow a whole lot put your tarp over your area let that tarp bake it for about you know a few weeks and you can tell when you pull that tarp off everything's dead on the surface then till it, put the tarp right back on it. You can, you can overhead water it a little bit if you want to. That's not going to hurt anything. Till it, give a little water, put the tarp back on it, leave it two more weeks, and keep repeating that for, I don't know, three or four times, and it will eventually get rid of it. That is the best thing I have found that will get rid of Bermuda grass um, because every time you till it, you'll stir up those old rhizomes and stuff, and then when you put the tarp on it, it will kill it and keep it from growing and flourishing more. Uh, it sounds like a lot of work, but it's really not, you know, just pulling back that tarp every couple of weeks and tilling it, but it works like a charm on Bermuda grass. Share with you a little something that I've learned a few years ago that the, what the, you know, back in the day, back <coughs> in the forties, fifties and sixties, the way the farmers dealt with Bermuda grass, and you'll find this interesting, is they turned their land in the fall of the year. Mm -hmm. And the reason they did that was when they turned and disrupted this Bermuda grass before it went dormant, they had a longer period of time that the grass uh, did not recuperate and they got a lot better control of that in the springtime of the year. So a lot of times your battle with Bermuda grass is won during the fall of the year before the freeze or the falls comes. They turn it in and then they give them a period of time so when it did come back up, maybe the cold weather hit it and knocked it back, or it did not survive that winter time through that disruption during the fall of the year. I never thought about that until I was told that's the way it was done. Yeah, and I think it's fair to assume somebody's having trouble with Bermuda grass, they live in the south. 
Oh, yeah. The Bermuda grass holds the world together down here, so don't think we're going to extinguish it. We always got a battle with it. You can, by working on it in the fall of the year, you can win the battle somewhat. Another thing, too, is just like the crab grass we talked about a while ago, you use those cover crops to shade this out, and that will help you a lot. Bermuda grass cannot grow under sun hemp, densely planted sun hemp, and sorghum sedan grass. It cannot survive in that environment. So, so you break that cycle. You got a Bermuda, that means you live in the south. That means you ain't going to be growing a whole lot in July, August, September, no way. So take those three months, do your tarp and till, really work on that, and then you can turn around and have a fabulous fall garden for your Bermuda grass. Or do that tarp technique, pull it off, and then put your cover crop in, then go to your fall that, crop. That works too. That works too. Our last question here is uh, from Shirley Kay, and she says, when you grow taters in a raised bed, how do you heal them up? That sounds like a silly question, but I've never grown them in a raised bed before. She's got her plants about 12 inches apart in a three by five raised bed. When we talk about healing, simply what we're doing is adding soil to the potato to that base of that plant and gives it more room to make potatoes, but also supports that plant. So in a raised bed situation, you can take your hoe and you can actually pull dirt up on there. Or if you have room in that raised bed, you simply just add soil. Add some compost. Add some compost, pot and soil, whatever you can. You know, the potato tower that was popular years ago was a little like a little 12 by 20 uh, planter. And what they did is they planted their potato plant in there and then they just kept adding soil to it. Now they was using an indeterminate variety, but that potato plant just continued to grow and make potatoes in there. So however you do it, whether you heal it by what we talk about healing by pulling soil to it or you add soil to it is beneficial to growing potatoes. Uh, yep, yep. Add soil, just get them up there on it, it help block out your weeds, lots of good benefits to it. All right, so we appreciate those questions. We always appreciate your comments and everything on the show. And that's going to do it for us tonight. If you enjoyed this show, make sure you give us a big thumbs up, a big share, a big like, and check out these other two videos right here. One of them is on keeping your weed seed bank low, which goes back to those questions. And another one is on that tarping technique we talked about. We'll see you guys next time. Take care.